Hello everyone and thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, How to Use Selenium Successfully, featuring Dave Hefner, a Selenium and test automation expert, as he steps through the why, how, and what of Selenium. My name is Christina Lyle and I'll be moderating today's session. You can contact me in the chat panel or the Q&A box if you're having any technical issues or questions. The Q&A panel is also the best place to submit questions you have for Dave as he goes through his presentation. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour. We are recording this session today, and once it's ready, you'll receive an email with the links to the recording and the slides. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and pass over to Dave. Um, thanks, Dave. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, so this is how to use Selenium successfully. Um, so let's, get, let's dig in. So when I first started doing test automation uh, several years back, um, I was new to it, uh, specifically with Selenium and in general. And I felt like it was like this. The landscape was like this in terms of getting started, finding information. It was a chasm. I felt like on the left was me and where I wanted to go was on the right. And on the right, I saw some potential luminaries, people in the industry who had done it successfully. And I couldn't help but figure out there was no way to safely jump across without threatening my life. It just felt like a really scary situation to be in. And over time, what I realized is it's not like this scenario here, that in fact, doing test automation with Selenium is a lot more like a puzzle. It's more like a Rubik's Cube. And the fun thing about a Rubik's Cube is that no matter the configuration of it, um, there are a set of patterns uh, that you can apply to it that regardless of its orientation, you can solve the puzzle. And I argue that doing test automation with Selenium within any organization is very similar. So the goal is the best place, I think, to start with regards to doing test automation with Selenium. Just make sure that we're all on the same page because I argue that every organization wants these same things. And that's to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across all relevant browsers. And then you want to package these tests up and scale them for you and your team. So knowing all of that, let's start with a brief Selenium overview. So Selenium, the in a nutshell version, um, it, a lot of people use it. I mean, it's gained popularity. It's used widely as a test automation tool. But fundamentally, it is a uh, open source library that is used to automate human interaction in a web browser. That's it. It's just used to automate a web browser. And uh, it is really good at mimicking human action. And it's not good at things other than that. So specifically in the web browser, things outside of the web browser, it has problems with like system level, operating system level things, and lower level things, like trying to get the status codes uh, of a page and those kinds of things. It's not really good for that. Um, there are different versions of Selenium uh, in terms of the form factors of how you apply it. So there, um, there's Selenium IDE, which is arguably a big part of how Selenium became popular. It's record and playback functionality. And then there is uh, local execution of tests, and then there is remote execution, uh, which is how you would scale things. And then Selenium has a bad rap uh, and, and this uh, association with it potentially being slow, brittle, and hard to maintain, that the tests you would write would be slow uh, to execute, would be brittle, um, break all the time, and as a result, be hard to maintain. And what I'm going to cover through this presentation is that um, addressing these issues, uh, they're all solvable. Uh, and, and really, these aren't the problems. The problem that Selenium has is information, uh, making sure it's easy to access. So I've broken things down into uh, a 10-step um, approach to you know, kind of demystifying Selenium and figuring out how to use it uh, successfully. So step one is defining a test strategy. And what I mean by that is not something kind of hand wavy or high-level consulting speak. It's actually four simple questions that you should ask. Uh, and answering these questions will help give you clarity around where to start. So the first question is, how does your business make money? And if your business does not deal directly in dollars and cents, perhaps you're a nonprofit or, or uh, some sort of entity that, that doesn't deal with money necessarily. But think about it then in terms of how do, you, how do you actually generate value for your end users? And then uh, what features of your application are actually being used? Uh, and 
this is something that most any organization with few exceptions should be able to gain access to that information based on their analytics usage, usage data. And also within that same vein, what browsers are actually being used by your users? And then the last question is, what things have broken in the application before? This one is going to be harder to glean, uh, but it's something that can be found. You could check defect tracking systems. You can have uh, you know, a fireside chat uh, uh, over you know, with people who have been at the organization for a long time and ask them you know, what things have broken. Uh, you could also just wait for a software release and then look for the developer who's sweating uh, nervously in the corner because he's, uh, he's assuming something's going to break. And you can ask him what that thing is. And basically what you want to do is get the answers to these questions and then create basically a simple backlog of, uh, of things to figure out to test. And, and ultimately this, these questions decipher and, and distill down into the outcome, which is what to test and which browsers to care about. Um, a lot of times organizations want to just start in with test automation and just automate everything. And that's, that's not really a worthwhile pursuit. Instead, focusing on the the crucial components of the business, of the application, and what is actually being used will help really filter things down to what's important. So step two, now that you know what to test, you want to pick a programming language, because writing tests with Selenium really requires uh, doing this uh, with a programming language, not relying on a record and playback tool, and then just hoping for the best. So uh, the first question organizations typically ask is, should we use the same language as the application? So we wrote our application in Java, Let's write our tests in Java. Well, that's, that is the most common question people ask, but I think a better question is to ask who's going to own the tests. If it's a team of testers who are new to programming, potentially, who, who are going to own this, the assumption that the devs on your feature development teams are going to be able to help assist with uh, writing test code isn't necessarily a sure thing. Uh, it's more likely that that would be kind of a piecemeal operation because they're so busy focused on actual feature development code for the business. So it's probably better off, you're better off thinking about who's going to own it, what's their interest level, what's their, what's their background, what's their experience. And uh, there may be a better language that's more uh, suited for them. And you know, if it's Java for your app, maybe Ruby is a better language for, uh, for people who are just going to be a dedicated test team writing test code for it. it. Really, it's just a matter of having this conversation around this question. And also, there's the conversation around, should I build a framework from scratch, or should I use an existing one? And with Selenium, there's actually a bunch of open source frameworks that exist. And at this link, you can go and see a list that I try to curate um, and try to keep as accurate as I can for all the open source frameworks that exist that I found. If you find one that's, uh, that's not on my list, then please feel free to, to send me a message uh, with it. I'd love to add it. So step three. Use Selenium fundamentals. Use Selenium for what it's good at. So as I mentioned, Selenium mimics human action. Um, what I didn't mention is that the actions that Selenium will use uh, can really be um, whittled down to just a few. A few common actions that are going to, you know, there's numerous actions it can do, but the most common ones that we're going to use, I'll cover those. And then with these actions, you have to use locators. And what locators are is information that tells Selenium which HTML element on a page you want to interact with. And so some common actions. You want to get a page, get a URL. And then the most common one you're going to use is find element. You're going to find an element on a page that you want to interact with. And then once you find it, you want to do something with it. You could click, you could submit a form, you can send keys, which is effectively just typing. And then you could check to see if something is visible on the page. You could check to see if it is displayed. So locators uh, is a very broad topic. And it can be very intimidating if you're just getting started. Um, so here are the different ways, the different strategies with which you can find and use locators. Um, they're listed here uh, alphabetically. But rather than kind of read through it and not really fully drop what it, what it all means, what I like to start with is thinking about what good locators are. Uh, they are unique, descriptive, and unlikely to change. And so that really rules a few of these out. So I would say then you should also just start with IDs and classes. That's going to be the most likely candidate for any elements on a page uh, to have semantic, descriptive, unique markup. And also, it is going to be the fastest uh, way for Selenium to execute a locator. It's going to be the, the most performant thing you can use. And then if you have parts of the page that are harder to reach because they don't really have unique or descriptive IDs or classes, 
you can use CSS selectors or XPath. But you want to do that with care because you could write very poor performing, very brittle locators with these. And there used to be a lot of controversy um, and misunderstanding around uh, CSS versus XPath, uh, specifically which one is faster. Uh, and then there's always a personal preference conversation around, you know, uh, are you, what are you more familiar with? If you're familiar with XPath, then perhaps, perhaps you want to use that. Um, the argument used to be that one was much slower than the other. Uh, and then uh, there were benchmarks that were ran that were several years, several, several years old that proved that this was the case, that there was a huge performance difference. But I reran those same benchmarks and found that it's actually a negligible difference, um, with the exception of like really, really poor performing, very brittle locators. But those are the kind of things you wouldn't typically want to use in your test anyway. So if you go to that first link, that's all the write-ups I, I have around doing benchmark testing. Uh, with Selenium, with CSS versus XPath. And then if you wanted to see a comparison of, of the different approaches to using CSS versus XPath, go to the second link. It's a good resource uh, on that information. So in terms of finding quality locators, um, if you're new to this, um, this is a helpful kind of primer in terms of how to get started. So all modern web browsers come with the ability to right-click on a web page and click inspect the page. And what that does is opens up a little developer toolbar and highlights the element that you're trying to inspect and it shows you the markup on the page. And from there you can find an ID or a class or something that's hopefully um, unique uh, and descriptive that you can use in your tests. And then once you've found that, you wanna verify the selection, verify the locator, so you know that it's gonna scope to the correct part of the page. And there's a couple ways to do this. Um, the way that's a little more dated now but it's still somewhat relevant, um, you can use a, a plugin uh, called FirePath or FireFinder, which is an add-on for Firebug and Firefox. Um, there's a lot of fires in that sentence, but basically it's, uh, it's an equivalent to um, using uh, just jQuery commands in a JavaScript console, but the effect is the same. So uh, at this link, I step through how to use it, and I have a video real quick to show, to just to demonstrate what I mean. Um, there's also the ability to, um, if you're new to locators and want to get more experience, you can learn through gaming. This is kind of a fun way I found for people to kind of get started uh, and, and uh, cut their teeth on uh, interacting with locators based on CSS selectors. If you go to this link, there's a little game. It's these dancing plates, and you use locators to basically knock things off the plates. It's kind of fun. And of course, um, this is, a, like, as I mentioned, a very broad topic. The, the most effective way I've found to find quality locators if you look at a page and you just have no clear way to find one, have a conversation with the people who built the app or are building the app, the front end devs uh, specifically, and tell them what you're trying to do. They could help you figure out, oh, there's this thing on the page that you can use, and it might not, might not have been obvious to you. Or they can add something. Um, a lot of times this is a trivial thing for them to do. So a conversation uh, will also help instill kind of the mindset of like, oh, that's what you're trying to do. So next time they build something, they might try to bake testability into the app. So here's an example of inspecting an element with Firebug and then verifying the locator with FireFinder. So I grab the, the actual form is login. So in CSS selector, it would be pound login because pound is an ID. And then if I wanted to verify the username input field, it would be pound username, pound password. And then there's the button. And so when, when I basically test these different locators to see if these would actually work in my tests, it's highlighting the different elements on the page. So then this saves me the step of having to go back to my test, you know, plug in a locator, run it, and see if I see what it, if it's doing what I think it's going to do. So this is a huge time saver. So now we've kind of covered all the the primer stuff around thinking about testing the right way. So let's talk about writing your first test and. Before we do that, um, there's just one more piece of information I think is quite relevant, which is good test anatomy. So every test that you write should be written for some kind of existing test framework. And by framework, test framework, framework in and of itself is an overloaded term, but by, what I mean by test framework is an existing thing like a behavior-driven development test framework or an X unit, a unit testing framework. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna talk about uh, and step through examples with Java and JUnit. JUnit is a, a unit testing framework. And you want to, in your test, you want to test one thing. You want your test to be atomic. And you want to make sure that each test can be run independently. So it should be able to handle its own setup and teardown and not rely on other tests 
so basically, you want your test to be autonomous. And then you want to make sure anyone, ideally, anyone can understand what your test is doing. Um, and so that way, that includes yourself, where if you come back to these tests you've written three months later, you can actually look at them, know what they're doing, and not hate your former self. And then the other thing is um, test groupings. Um, you know, similar tests should live with, with tests like itself. So if you have like a, an entire component of an app, you can have tests that reside within a folder that test that specific thing. If you wanted to create groupings of, of different tests uh, across different uh, components, there's actually a way to handle that dynamically without having to move files to different places. So just really simple, good uh, test uh, organization around grouping similar tests together. So that's it. Um, and let's talk about a login example. So uh, if we were using Selenium to test login, a very common piece of functionality found on the web, something that everybody has had to deal with at some point or will have to deal with, you would use Selenium to visit the login form. And then once you've loaded that login form, uh, you would find the username input field, and then you'd want to input text into it. And then the same thing goes for the password field, and then you'd want to find the submit button and click it, or you could find the form and submit the form. So I have this example app uh, called the Internet. It's an open source app where I basically uh, create functional recreate functionality that I find on the web that's that's useful for testing. It's just stuff you're going to have to run into. It's a good way to kind of level set your tests. Like if you have an issue in your app, uh, and then sometimes people email me questions, then I can say, does your test work against this app? Um, and also for demonstration purposes. So we're going to use the login example on the internet, which looks like this. And we just step through finding locators for that field. So we know what those locators are. With Selenium, they would look like this. So we would, uh, I've omitted the setup and teardown stuff, but needless to say, I've created an instance of Selenium with a browser, uh, stored it in a driver variable. And then once I have that, I use, I call dot get and then pass the URL as a string. So it's the internet.herokuapp.com slash login. And then once I've loaded that page, I find an element. And in this case, we're using the ID of that element. So find element by ID. And then I want to type uh, the, the username. So that send keys is how you type in Selenium. And then same thing goes for password. And then in this case, I am finding the element uh, of the form and then submitting that form. And so what that looks like in JUnit with a test wired up is this. At the top of the test class um, is I'm importing uh, all the different classes I need to use. So the JUnit annotations and then all of the different classes for Selenium. Uh, and then I declare the class. So and it's a public class uh, test login. And then um, I create a private variable to store uh, the instance of Selenium. It's just a web driver variable. And then I have three different methods. I have a setup, I have the, the test with the name succeeded, and then teardown. And then the setup and teardown uh, is where I'm creating and destroying an instance of Selenium. And in this case, I'm using Firefox because out of the box, Firefox works, there's no additional setup required. And then in the test, I, I'm plugging in those commands. And on top of each of these methods, there are what's called annotations. Uh, this is metadata that you apply to your methods and uh, it tells uh, JUnit what you want to do with those things. So a before annotation uh, basically will will make sure that that method, the setup method, runs before each test. And then the after will run after each test. Uh, and then the test annotation obviously denotes that this is a test, the, the succeeded method is a test. So this is all well and good. We have our test code wired up, but it's not actually doing anything. It's just going to run and pass uh, because there's no assertion. So we need to you know, and find some information on the page and then f assert that it's what we expect. So to do that, the steps would be we'd manually log in, we would inspect the page after we've logged in to, you know, find something to help verify the state of the page. So we'd find a locator for that thing, and then we'd verify it in the browser to make sure it's doing what we expect, and then we'd add it to our test, add the assertion to the test. So if we take the example of login, and we actually step through it manually, we would want to inspect the page. So there's a couple options here. The first place I would look would be this log app button. Is there anything semantic here? Not really, it's just a button. Um, there's not really anything helpful. So the other option would be this uh, flash notification at the top of the page. And it looks like there is some semantic markup in the class, so flash success. So what we'll do is we'll grab those two classes and then CSS selectors for those would be dot flash dot success because it's two classes and then we'd have to squish them together because it's all just one class string. 
And so what that would look like in a test would be this. We would want to pull in the JUnit assert library, and then we would want to assert that uh, this element was displayed on the page. And so the way, it, there's a couple of different ways to write the order of an assertion, but I'm using assert true, and then uh, we have a message that will display if the test fails. So in this case, it's saying success message not present, and then uh, find element of the CSS selector that we found, and then checking to see if it is displayed. And so when we run this, it'll pass just like it would have before, but this time there'll actually be an assertion. So if, the, if that wasn't displayed on the page, then we would actually uh, you know, have a failing test and it would be legitimate. So the other thing to point out is what's commented out here, uh, if this assert true with, a, uh, with this fat fingered um, uh, locator. I always keep this in here just as a reminder to always test uh, your locators uh, in your tests, uh, specifically with a bad locator, just to force, try and force a failure. Make sure that you can see the test fail and make, make sure it's doing what you expect because sometimes you might be uh, surprised uh, and, and really you shouldn't trust a test unless you've seen it fail. And then you can revert it back to make sure that it's passing. So that's just a good practice um, for, for good test hygiene. And then there's also the thought of exception handling. Um, within Selenium, if you uh, try to find something that's not on the page, so if we test the negative condition, trying to see if uh, the success message wasn't on the page uh, or the failure message wasn't on the page, then we wouldn't get a test failure. We'd actually get an exception like this. It would say no such element exception. And um, that's, that's actually normal behavior for Selenium. And the two most common exceptions you're gonna run into would be no such element and stale element reference error. Uh, and the latter one has to do with timing issues, but that's not something we'll, we'll step through right now. No such element's the most common. Um, and then if you actually wanna see a list of all the different available uh, web driver exceptions, then you can check out this link here. But if we take the no such element exception and wire it up, it looks like this. Here's an, here's an example where, say we want to test the negative condition. We wanna see if something is not displayed on the page. So we would want to basically say, tell Selenium, look, look at this page and tell me if something is not there. Without doing anything, it would just return an exception unless we catch it like this. So we do wrap our find, uh, find element action and then catch it. And we're catching for no such element exception and then returning false. So instead of returning an exception and raising it and failing the test, we'll just return false. Then we can actually perform an assertion based on that. And then if you want a more thorough walkthrough of exception handling, you can check out this link at the bottom here. So we've covered the first four steps, step through just basically writing our first test, talk a little bit about exception handling. So let's, let's talk a little bit more now about building on that um, in step five, which is writing reusable and maintainable test code. So um, page objects, if you spend any time uh, in the Selenium space, that's typically one of the first things you hear. It's the most talked about uh, thing in Selenium, I think, um, aside from explicit weights. But, page objects. Um, so what they are and why they're important. Right now, if we just keep writing our tests like we have them, we are writing all of our locators in our tests and we'd end up with a bunch of tests and the application. And then if the application changes, then all of our tests would fail and we'd have to go to every single test and update it and be very unhappy. And this is where the notion of Selenium being uh, hard to maintain, writing tests that are hard to maintain. This is exactly why. But there's a simple practice, which is using a page object. So what you can do is create uh, a class, an object um, in, your, in your test code, which represents parts of the application and then write your tests against that object. So that way, if the application changes, uh, you need to just update the page object and then your tests will work again. You'll need to go to one place uh, because all of the locators and all that behavior is abstracted into the one object. So let's take a look at what a page object would look like for the login example we just stepped through. So um, I've went ahead and uh, made this login page object and it covers the happy path that we stepped through in the test. I also added the uh, sad path of giving, uh, you know, potentially giving bogus credentials and wanting to check the negative condition. But let's step through this uh, piece by piece. At the top of the class, there is the imports uh, for the different things we need. So specifically, it's just for Selenium. And then uh, there's also uh, importing an assertion. I'll get to that in a second. But we declare a class, and then we declare a variable for Selenium. Uh, and then we have our locators stored at the top. And 
in, in simple uh, in simple values. So things like username locator, password locator, login form locator, and the by information. So by ID, username, etc. And so we have these in one central place uh, that represents the single source of truth for login in the app is stored here. And then the next piece here is the constructor. Um, and that's basically how we're making sure we're catching the, the Selenium instance. And then we can add steps in here to make sure that the page is in the correct state. So in this example, we're visiting the login page here. And then we're also asserting that the login form is displayed. Um, and what this does is, is it makes sure that uh, this, this test that you, any test that uses this login page object will verify that the page is in the correct state before proceeding. And if not, it'll, it'll fail and it will give this helpful message saying the login form was not present. The meat of this, though, is really these last three pieces here, um, this, this method called with. Uh, login with, and it's accepting two arguments, a username and a password. And what this makes, uh, what this enables us to do is reuse this login behavior uh, where we're inputting, uh, filling in the login form and submitting it. Uh, it's enabling us to reuse that through numerous tests very easily. And, and then we're using the locators from above. And then the success message present and the failure message present is how we're abstracting the, the lookup of the display check uh, for the flash notification messages um, that, that would appear after logging in. So, so that's that. This is all the behavior, state and behavior of a login page here. And what that looks like when we put it into our test is this. It takes our test as it was before and makes it more succinct and much more readable. So the differences we've had to do here are we have to import the page object, um, create a variable to store it, and then create a, uh, instantiate a, a version of it, so create an instance of it, and pass it the driver object. But after that, we can use it freely within our tests. So then we say login with, and then the username and password. And then we assert what we want based on the methods that we created, these, these helper methods. So uh, login.successMessagePresent should return a true or a false. Same goes for failure message present. And then we assert that it's what we expect. If not, then we, we return this, uh, this objective message that we put in here. And then the before, uh, then the after stays the same, and that's pretty much it. So. There's, there's a lot to talk about with page objects. Um, every year at Selenium Conf, there are numerous talks about this. Um, there are also numerous blog posts about this. There's a lot of different opinions about page objects. Uh, but the things I'll leave you with are, uh, there are two different uh, ways to approach it that I think are, are most commonly used. The first one is um, this library called HTML Elements, which is written by this company called Yandex. They open sourced this library called HTML Elements, which makes page object creation uh, more streamlined if you wanted to not just use uh, plain old Java objects. And then there's, of course, um, something built into Selenium called Page Factory. So if you visit these two links, then you can see more information about that. And then the other component here um, is what I call a base page object. Um, now, I, having talked about this numerous times with numerous companies and, and numerous meetups and conferences, I've realized that different people have different names for the same thing. So it's also known as a Selenium wrapper or a utility class. Your name may be different for your organization as well. So whatever you call it, let me just step through the core tenets of it. So right now, I've just stepped through how to abstract things into a page object. And that's all great. You know, If you do just that, that's huge. Then there's the next evolution of that. The next step would be um, making it so you take your Selenium commands as they are uh, out of just your page objects and put them into a central class. And what this enables you to do is gain global reuse of simple method names. And then it also makes your page objects more readable. Just like when you did, you know, we just stepped through a page object making your test more readable, now your page objects will become more readable as well. And the big one, although it's less of an issue nowadays, but it insulates you from API changes in Selenium. This was a very true thing, very real thing in the migration uh, from Selenium RC to Selenium 2. And the move from Selenium 2 to Selenium 3, there won't be huge swinging change, changes like this. But um, nevertheless, this is definitely a helpful practice um, in terms of uh, creating uh, consistency in your test code. And if you're curious about some more thoughts that went into this. Um, here's a link to a recap of Jason Labia's closing keynote from Selenium Conf uh, 2013, where he stepped through how they did this huge migration um, using this exact pattern for what they did at Google, migrating millions of tests uh, from, from Selenium RC to Selenium 2. 
So here's what a base page object would look like um, using just plain a plain uh, Java class. So we would have some simple methods here, and, and the most common ones I'm, I'm using here would be instead of driver.get, I'm creating a method called visit because I think that you know to me that reads uh, more easily. And then instead of find element, we're just calling find, just click. Uh, instead of send key, just type, um, and then submit for the form. And then uh, in the central place here, for we could create an is displayed method and, and take care of exception handling. So here's what that would look like implemented for a login page object. So now um, there's no Selenium commands here. And the, you know, so like we just call visit. And we establish inheritance, obviously, uh, where the page object would inherit from the base page object. And then we would gain access uh, by calling super in the constructor. So then we get visit, we get is displayed, we get all the methods I just showed you. So then it makes this more concise. So how everything fits together with this uh, this new architecture, it's a bottom-up uh, approach where you start with a base page object uh, and that wraps your Selenium commands. And then you have page objects and they inherit from the base page. And then all of your tests uh, use the page objects like building blocks to create really quick and easy tests. So that's pretty much the gist. And so your tests are very succinct. They read very easily. Uh, and then they're just using the behavior stored in page objects and then page objects use the behavior stored with regards to Selenium um, and all the smarts you put into it with exception handling and all that in a, in a central place. So um, that's the first half, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. Um, and if you're already doing that, then, then you're well ahead of the bunch. Um, and then now we can move into talking about making your test resilient. And so aside from page objects, this is probably the equally, if not the, the next most important topic. Um, and that's waiting, making your tests um, synchronize with your application to make sure that they, uh, they have proper timing. And uh, so there's three ways to do that. And this is specifically for, for apps uh, and asynch asynchronous apps. So pretty much every app that exists nowadays has JavaScript. And so uh, how, how do we basically deal with that where we, you know, we click a button and, and there's no way to tell if like a page is finished loading because there's like all these things happening on the page. So you could hard code sleeps into your tests, which I'll just go ahead and cross that off the list because that's a horrible idea unless you have a really good use case. There's very few use cases where that's a good idea. And then that leaves the two functions built into Selenium, an implicit wait and explicit waits. Within Selenium, at the outset in your test setup, you can basically say, uh, unless I tell you otherwise, just wait. Uh, if you can't do something immediately, wait for this, um, this many seconds. Uh, and then there's explicit waits where uh, you basically can specify uh, a wait time for a targeted action. Uh, and the recommendation from the project is to use explicit waits. So uh, go ahead and cross off implicit wait. Um, and I do that because um, while you could use implicit and explicit waits together, you shouldn't. And, uh, and there are trade-offs between the two, uh, but the, the gist is explicit waits win. <laughs> Like I stepped through a bunch of different examples in this write-up and uh, and found some uh, some feedback from uh, Jim Evans on the Selenium uh, core committers team, and, where it's like, don't mix implicit and explicit weights. You'll you'll have a hard time, uh, and it won't be easy to identify that that's the issue. So the the best uh, the best of breed solution is to just use explicit weights. And what explicit weights are uh, are basically where you tell Selenium to you specify an amount of time and, and an action with Selenium. And then Selenium will try that action repeatedly until either that action can be completed or uh, the amount of time that you specified has been reached and it will throw a timeout exception. And so an example for that would be this, uh, this kind of form here. So you click a button, a loading bar appears for like an indeterminate amount of time, and then something happens. So in this case, hello world appears on the page. So we'll want to wait and say, okay, let's wait till that appears on the page. And so the locator would be just pound finish. That's the finish text. So what that looks like if we implement this in a base page object, now that we have this simple uh, architecture, would be this. We can abstract the Selenium uh, WebDriver wait function, uh, which is just WebDriver wait, uh, and then you specify the timeout, and then you say, I want to wait until a condition. We can wrap this in a helpful method where we can reuse this functionality, and then what it's relying on is uh, an, an expected condition. Um, and then uh, in this method, we can also specify a timeout. And what I've done here is um, specify it with a ternary operator. So it's like, it, it's basically saying if a timeout is provided, use it. Uh, and if not, then use five seconds. So if we do nothing, just use five seconds for the for a default timeout. 
And then what that would look like once we apply it would be this method where, let's say, we want to wait for to see if something is displayed. And the expected condition that we'll use for that is a visibility of element located. And then by using the dot 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 operator uh, as a parameter uh, type option, then we're able to make it so we don't have to specify timeout if we don't want to. Uh, and if we don't, then five seconds will be used. Otherwise, um, it's going to proceed. And then we'll catch the timeout exception and return false. So if we actually wanted just to say, wait for the thing is displayed. And if it's not displayed, then return false instead of returning a timeout exception. So if we create a page object for that page I just showed you uh, with, the, with the button in the loading bar, it would look something like this potentially. So there, the two locators would be the start button and then the finish text. And then we would want to create something that would load the, there's two different examples. So we'll shoot, create a method that will visit the correct example and click the start button. And then the, the meat of this is really in the finish text present method. Uh, this method where, this helper method where we're extracting things out to do this display check. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait to see if the finished text is present for 10 seconds. And so that's it, that's, that's explicit way. It's, that's like a, a, a clean way to potentially abstract things. And, um, and then there's of course browser timing considerations. And, and the gist is really that each browser is a little bit different in terms of how its execution speed. And uh, there's also some considerations in terms of how they handle certain locators. So, uh, so you know, don't be surprised if you write your test in one browser, run it in another, and then you run into issues. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's an iterative process to write your test once and run them on every browser. You need to work out the kinks as you switch from browser to browser. That's really the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest tip I can give you. And that's normal. That's just how it is with Selenium. Um, you can't just uh, write your test once and, and then they magically run in other browsers. There's just some, there's some maintenance work to go into it. But once you get it working, it's usually pretty straightforward after that. So the last three steps, I'll just try to breeze through here so we have enough time for questions. Um, prepping for use. So now we have uh, well-factored code with explicit weights, page objects, et cetera. So we want to prep things for use. So if you're, not, if you're already using a, an open source framework, then, then they'll have their own specific organizational structure and, and they'll take care of all this prep. But if you're just going to create your own framework, this is a good starting point. So, uh, and when I talk about test framework, the, the way I've unloaded the term is I talk about a test harness. We're going to create a test harness for all of our test code. And what that looks like is a few different things. One is simple organizational structure. Like you want to have a, a place to put your tests, a place to put your page objects, a place to put your config information, uh, and then potentially a place to put third party libraries like a vendor directory. Uh, and then you want to centralize your setup and teardown. So we remove it from all of our tests and put it in one place. And then uh, we want to make it so at runtime we can configure it. To, to do different things, like run on different browsers, run at different uh, base URLs, that kind of stuff. And, and if we specify nothing, we want to make sure that there, is, there are sensible defaults so that the test would, would still run if we didn't say, uh, specify anything. And then, we, of course, uh, running tests are great, but when there's a failure, we want to know that uh, we can look at the test failure and actually discern what the issue was. And so we want to look at reporting and logging. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, in order to make your tests uh, fast to address the speed concern is to run your tests in parallel to make sure that you can run multiple concurrent tests at the same time. And then, of course, uh, I mentioned this uh, way to potentially group tests dynamically into different execution uh, bundles that, that we'll also talk about that. Um, folder structure, I already covered that, so we'll just skip past that. Let's go to central setup and teardown. Um, within Java and JUnit, there's a couple of different ways to slice this. Um, the best way I've found is to create a base test. And in that base test, um, instead of using the before and after annotations, we actually can use a JUnit rule called external resource. And within that, there are these before and after methods. And what they do is they actually execute before a before annotation and after an after annotation. So by doing this approach, we're actually able to handle our setup and teardown correctly and still preserve the ability to use the before and after annotations in our tests. And so that's like a huge win. And, um, and so that's just the approach I take. If you want to look at the other JNet rules and just kind of understand more about what that is, uh, then you can take a look at this link here for the documentation. And then the idea of simple config with defaults, here is, here's an approach. Um, creating a static class um, with final variables. Uh, and in this case, I have just a handful, the ones that are typically relevant um, immediately, which is a, a base URL. 
because um, you're going to have different endpoints for your app, right? You're going to have local development, you're going to have tests, staging, production, et cetera. So you want a way to swap those out easily. Uh, the browser you care about, uh, the host, if you're going to run your tests on your local machine or on a grid or on someone else's grid. Uh, and then, of course, the version uh, of that browser and the platform that you want, Windows or OS X, et cetera. And then if you're using a third party like Sauce Labs, then you would want to you know, specify the credentials some, in some way. And the way that I'm um, storing sensible defaults here, uh, I'm using a get property, which uh, is going to be a runtime property. Uh, and I'm specifying what those are here. So at runtime, you could specify dash D and then the property name, and then you could specify a new value. And then if one isn't specified, then it's going to use these sensible defaults that are listed here. And then for the credentials, I typically don't uh, hard code those or do anything like that. Um, I use uh, get env to pull the, uh, the environment variable out of my system, and I store these, these values locally on my system. Uh, and that way, if different people have different access credentials, then you know, you're not storing sensitive data and potentially running tests on the wrong, wrong account, et cetera. And then to actually use this config is really straightforward. You just have to import this config where it's needed. So like in the base test, you just do import static test.config uh, and, and asterisk. And then you'd get all these, uh, all these variables. So um, reporting and logging. Uh, I like to differentiate things as machine readable and human readable, uh, mainly because there's things for your continuous integration server uh, for trend data and, and just helpful information over time. So you can actually check the life of a, of a job and tests in continuous integration. And that's not really useful for humans necessarily, except in aggregate when you're looking at the data after the fact. But the, the really important stuff is the human readable stuff, like screenshots, failure messages, stack trace. So you can actually look and say, oh, what happened? And what was the state of the page? So I want screenshots of the app. I want the failure message. And ideally, the stack trace. So then I can discern if there is an issue in my test code or actually if it's a legitimate issue in the app. And then um, up until a couple years ago, there wasn't really a great solution for like a robust uh, report tool for generating reports. Everyone kind of had to make their own. Uh, but then uh, the guys who made the HTML elements library at Yandex I mentioned earlier, they also made this open source library called Allure. Allure is a great framework. It's language agnostic. It works for every test framework uh, that's popular. Um, and there's a write-up on how, how I've used it um, at that link there. Basically, it's something that you could just add in uh, to your existing test code, and then it will output a really slick uh, Angular app that just has screenshots and just looks really good, um, works really well. And then parallelization. Um, there's a few different ways to handle that. You can do it in code through your test runner uh, or uh, through continuous integration. Some CI servers do that for you. Uh, the recommended approach with Java and JUnit is to use uh, the Maven Surefire plugin. Uh, and there's the link to the documentation. It's actually extremely easy to do. Uh, and so there's really no, there's like the barrier to entry is so low. Um, and then the pro tip would be to enforce a random order execution of tests. Um, and that ensures that it helps you identify any sort of dependencies across tests. It could be like using the same user account across numerous tests that one of those tests happens to take a destructive action, which then causes you know, transient failures. It's, it could be horrible. But running them in random order can help make sure you identify those to make sure your tests truly are autonomous. Um, and then it also has the added benefit of ex exercising the application you're testing in a random order each time. So this, this link goes to a blog post from Thomas Sundberg, who, uh, who, who's a great resource uh, in the industry. Uh, his blog is really good around like Java, JUnit testing, um, and Selenium. And it's a blog post on how to, how to simply set up uh, random order execution. And then test grouping. Um, within JUnit, it's uh, super easy. You just apply metadata. Uh, there's like another annotation um, for categories. Categories uh, enables what I call, uh, or what I refer to as test packs, which uh, was a term coined by Goiko Atzig on how to create a dynamic grouping of tests, regardless of where they live in a folder structure. Um, so when you run your tests, uh, you know, Maven uh, and JUnit, they would like, they would consume all the tests that they'd, they'd have, uh, a digest of all those tests, and then it would just start, like it filter down to just the, the the categories that you specify at runtime. And so, some examples of what that could look like: um, there's you could you could identify work in progress tests, so you can ignore those. Um, you can then identify tests that are super critical or shallow, uh, which is a term I believe Adam Goucher coined shallow and deep tests. But you could think of it as smoke and regression if you want, or sanity checks, um, and then you know, deeper crucial tests, and then just a way to basically identify like 
say five tests that are super relevant, immediately relevant to determine that the app is, is alive, is healthy. Um, and then you can have a, another group uh, of tests run that maybe take a little bit longer and test some more in-depth stuff. And then you can have like really long running tests that run at night. Um, you could also use this metadata as an opportunity to apply story numbers. So you could very easily create um, a group of tests based on the features that are being released uh, that, in a sprint. And then if you really want more information uh, around the implementation details uh, of JUnit categories and, and more uh, potentially uh, eloquent way to describe it, then you could check out the documentation at this link. And uh, okay, so step eight, um, add in cross-browser execution. So really this is kind of the, the next step, uh, you know, taking your tests and scaling them outward. So um, you can run your tests locally. Uh, so if you have your tests and you want to try them on different browsers, you have to uh, look at the documentation for each browser. So here are the different links. There's Chrome has its own, you know, each one has its own page, Chrome, Firefox, IE, Edge, and Safari. And um, each one requires a little bit of setup. Uh, you have to download a, a binary, potentially add it to your path. And if not, then you have to, uh, you can actually uh, add it in code. So for Chrome, uh, you download this thing called Chrome Driver, and then you can specify uh, the actual path to the Chrome driver here. Uh, and that way, if you really want to be clever, you could create a vendor directory, download Chrome driver, put it there so that everyone that uses it has a consistent version they're using and then, you know, sets a property like this. Um, and then, ta-da, then you can use Chrome. If you don't do this or if you don't add it to your path, then when you run Chrome, it's going to say, you need Chrome driver, you need to add it to your path. <laughs> so uh, this, is a, this is one way to do it in code. Uh, in a way that would be consistent for everybody that would use the test code that you just wrote. And then, um, so aside from locally, uh, this is where it gets interesting. You can run your tests on a grid, and what that looks like is you take your tests and you point them at a grid hub. And that's just a server that receives commands from your tests, and then it farms things out to different nodes. And these different nodes represent different operating systems and browser configurations. And then uh, it would return a browser to your tests, run your tests, on these nodes and then return the results. And so it's all done with one file, the Selenium standalone server jar. And you just specify different runtime flags depending on if you want a hub or a node and how do you register the node with, with the hub. So what that looks like really quickly is this. On a hub, you would say java-jar, the file, and then you specify the role, which is hub. And then for nodes, you'd say role node and then specify the hub and provide the URL to it with uh, the path of slash grid slash register. And in this example, I'm, I'm doing this all on one machine. Um, but I mean, clearly you'd want to do this on a series of machines uh, to have a true infrastructure that's working well. So, that, so that's Selenium Grid. Um, and, and there's a lot of considerations for running your own infrastructure. Um, so what that would look like in uh, in your test setup, in that base test that I showed earlier, instead of just saying new Firefox driver, you could do this. You create a object called a desired capabilities object. And what this object is used for is specifying the browser uh, and the platform. And then you connect to the grid hub using a remote web driver and then pass it these capabilities. And that's how you tell Selenium Grid what you want. And that's how it knows how to give you the correct browser on the correct operating system. Um, so there's a lot more information. Uh, this is just like the very cursory uh, walkthrough, but there is the wiki, obviously, the documentation for Selenium Grid. Uh, there's a, a write-up on a little bit more uh, in-depth walkthrough of Selenium Grid at that link. Um, and then there's two open source libraries, which are really good. Uh, there's Selenium Grid Extras, which uh, came out of Groupon from Dima Kovalenko, who's one of the committers on the Selenium project. And he, uh, they have this really great library that makes maintaining a grid a lot easier. Uh, and also gives you some video recording. And then there's Selenium Grid um, Scaler, which came out of Retail Me Not, which is how to basically, you know, auto-provision a Selenium Grid that has its own health checks to make sure that it's constantly thriving, and then shuts down when it's done. Um, so that, that's another option as well, both open source and both uh, maintained. And then, of course, um, it, you know, Grid is not for the faint of heart. Uh, so there's third parties uh, providers like Sauce Labs, which, uh, which you know, full disclosure, I use for testing my, uh, my applications. Um, but it's very straightforward, it's very similar to a uh, grid, except for the fact that you don't have to maintain the grid. So you just point to Sauce Labs and they give you the browser on the correct operating system that you care about.
And it's very similar in terms of the setup code. Uh, you create a desired capabilities object, and then you just uh, you provide the browser, browser version, platform, et cetera, and then you connect using your username and access key to their, uh, their proprietary grid hub URL, and then you pass up the capabilities. And then there's some additional considerations with the setup, um, which are fairly straightforward, but you need to know about them. So you need to make sure you pass the correct test name, because if you don't, it's just not going to have the correct test name in the job. And then you need to make sure that you set the correct pass-fail sta status on the job in Sauce Labs. Uh, and then there's also, um, if you have an application that's behind a firewall um, or just you know, restricted somehow, uh, then they have a secure tunnel option where you can stand up a tunnel and have and basically connect the Sauce Cloud to your, uh, your machine that's doing the testing so it can access the correct um, application. And then for more info, um, there's uh, all the different platforms that Sauce Lab supports at this link. And then there's a, a write-up I have on how to use Sauce. Um, and then there's, of course, their Java documentation for getting started. And, uh, and the, I think the real benefit, aside from having, like, turnkey usage of a slow name grid that, that's just working, uh, is the, the output you get, the, the actual report from, from a job. So here's what it looks like. Uh, for their latest uh, UI upgrade. So you can see all the screenshots from different parts of the test. You can watch a video, a full screencast of the test as it was running. And then you can also check out the logs. Uh, so it's the Selenium log, uh, as well as the Chrome, this is a Chrome test, so it's a Chrome log, and then all the meta metadata that was passed in as well. Uh, it's just like a, a, a huge amount of, of information. And so it's very easy to make it so when a test fails, the, the URL for the job gets outputted into the test output. And so step nine, really this is tying everything together, building an automated feedback loop. And so the biggest uh, advantage uh, of why we do this is we're building, we write all these tests because we want to create a feedback loop. We want to make sure it's not just us hitting, hitting a button on our machine running our tests. We actually want to make sure that we're writing tests, we're putting it into a system that's automated, and ideally that automated system is tied into the existing development workflow. And so you, the goal is, of course, to find failures early and often, uh, and, and you do that with continuous integration and notifications. Like, that's like the simplest, uh, stupid simple way to do it. And then there's notifications, there's a myriad of ways to do it. For remote teams, there's email, there's chat, there's text message. For in-person teams, there's audiovisual indicators that can denote like, oh, the, like a build failed or some sort of call out that a job had failed. And so the way I think of this is, is a really simple approach to, to doing code promotion. Um, so you have developers who commit feature code and then their unit and integration tests ideally would pass on a continuous integration server. And if they do, then there should be a job that deploys uh, the application to a server that's dedicated for automated testing. And I say that because there's there's a lot of teams that have test uh, an environment dedicated for testing for manual testers, and then if you introduce automated testing, then then you know you can step on each other's toes very easily. So you want to have a, de uh, a separation of those two. So you have an automated test environment, and then if that deployment is successful, then you should kick off um, your automated tests. Specifically, uh, you know a tagged uh, a uh, dynamic grouping like we talked about with categories, like a really small shim of your tests that can quickly give you feedback that the app is running. So like a really like stupid simple thing would be uh, you can load the web page and log in. Like, did that work? If not, then you know, there's got to be something horribly wrong. Um, and so assuming that you run those and they pass, then you should say you could either run another set of tests that's deeper or deploy to the next environment. And by doing this, you can, you can get one step closer to continuous delivery and really fast feedback. And so if any of these are no, uh, if there's any point of this is, is broken, you should really notify the team and ideally stop the line. You know, make it so like nothing should proceed until this issue is addressed. Ideally, there's two kinds of, um, uh, I guess nobody really realizes this until they, they learn the hard way, but you know, you're writing feature code, you know, you're part of a team that's writing feature code to, to make the business money. And you're also writing infrastructure code like this, test automation, continuous integration. That's, that's also like a business critical thing because it serves the other one. So you really have to treat it uh, almost as, you know, as equal footing as, as the feature code is being uh, actively built. So um, the simplest way to get started, if, if you know, it's hard to plug into your existing CI uh, for your team, 
uh, and you just want to you know, kick the tires on something, maybe you're not ready to go you know, all in, but there's a really simple way to get started um, using an open source uh, continuous integration tool like Jenkins. Uh, so you just go to the Jenkins website and you can download uh, their WAR file. And then you could just say uh, Jenkins dash jar, the WAR file, and then it stands up the, the Jenkins server and then you just open it up in a web browser. Super simple. And then once you do that, it's easy. You just create a job and then you find a way to pull in your test code. So if you're running locally, you just have to specify the full path to your test code. Um, and then you could set up build triggers. So you can have it run on a schedule or you can have it uh, you know, ping the, an existing continuous integration server to know when to run. And then you can configure the build steps. So it, you, know, you specify the access credentials you need and then specify all the setup commands for the test code to run. And then you configure your test reports. So if there's JNN XML and you know, an HTML report, like you can just have all that be, be uh, consumed in this job. And then set up the notifications. Um, there's plugins. There's so many plugins for Jenkins. So if you wanted like a, a Slack chat plugin, it's easy to install, quick to install, and then you just plug in your credentials to the Slack room, and then ta-da! When the tests fail, it'll just it'll just you know send a, a failure message into the chat that everyone can can click a link and jump to that job and see it failed. And then of course you want to run your tests and make sure that things are working as they should. And of course once it's all done, the most important step: high five your neighbor. Boom. So the last thing I'll leave you with, I'm not going to go through this just because um, we're all, you know, I'm always so short on time when I give this talk, but here are links to finding information on your own. Uh, in 2014, I gave this presentation. A lot of this information is still relevant and valid. Uh, 2014 at SlamConf, uh, at this first link, that's a, a recap video of my talk. Um, and then the slides from the talk are available at the second link. And then the third link, if you're more of a person that likes the, the long-form write-up, um, that's the long-form blog version of it. But basically, it steps through all the available resources on the web for Selenium uh, and talks through like which parts of it are, are valuable and relevant uh, and, and just tries to give you kind of a full perspective of the landscape as it is today. So um, just to recap, the, step, the steps to solve the puzzle for Selenium, um, define a test strategy, pick a programming language, use Selenium for what it's good at, its fundamentals, write your first test, and then from there you can write reusable, maintainable test code, and then make your test resilient with explicit weights, package your tests up into a harness or a framework, whatever you want to call it, and then add in cross-browser execution, and then ultimately put it all together when you build an automated feedback loop, and then of course go out and find information on your own. And, um, and when you do, then you're able to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across all relevant browsers, and you can package them up and scale them for you and your team. And I'll just leave you with this quote. You may think your puzzle is unique, but really, everyone is trying to solve the same puzzle. Yours is just configured differently, and it's solvable. And you can quote me on it. So just uh, the last thing, and I'll leave this slide up here. Um, I write about Selenium a lot. Um, so Elemental Selenium. Dot com. Uh, this is my weekly free newsletter where I, I share tips on how to use Selenium. And, uh, and if you want a boot camp, if you're just like just new to Selenium and you want something really quick and easy, I have a five part boot camp. If you go to this link, you can sign up and get a five day email course. And then of course I, I wrote a book um, with video walkthroughs and it's, it's a very self-paced learning which takes everything I talked about in this talk and then a bunch more and steps through it in depth and, in a way that's like, basically spoon feeding you and building upon all the concepts until you have a fully working set of tests plugged into continuous integration that's configured. Uh, so seleniumguidebook.com. Uh, and then it, I also have a free sample where I, I have the first six chapters I give away uh, if you go to that link. And then um, both of these are available in Java and Ruby and I'm gonna work on additional languages later this year. And of course, um, you can find me on Twitter, you can email me and you can see what I'm up to on my website. And, uh, and with that, um, I'll take some questions. Yeah, so we, we've run out of time, so we probably won't get to many, but I'll throw out a few questions. And just because you're talking about this topic right now about um, coming out with additional languages, a lot of people are asking, you know, do you recommend um, a certain language, like why Java versus JavaScript, um, Python? Is there any, anything you could say around that? 
Sure. Uh, so the way I look at it is if you're new to programming, then you know, a compiled language like Java might not be like the, the best uh, place to start. So I typically encourage people to look at scripting languages like Python or Ruby. Um, but I mean, it really depends on how involved, like if, if it's an environment where you have a lot of Java de developers and they actually are interested in writing tests, then, then maybe Java makes a lot of sense. Um, having stepped through a lot of the, you know, converting all my content over to Java, Java is actually fairly approachable. You just have to understand uh, the specifics about it. And there's really, once you get the hang of that, it's not too bad. And then, um, but JavaScript is, is a huge, hugely popular, gaining a lot of ground uh, set of language bindings. And so I think that I, I see JavaScript as, as equally relevant, but it really depends. I mean, um, it, it really depends on the environment that you're in. If you have people that are really gung-ho about learning JavaScript, sure, do that. If you have front-end developers who are really into testing, awesome, use JavaScript. But then it gets tricky if you already have an existing test framework written in Java and you want to convert it. So I think um, what I really encourage people to say is like, who's really going to be working on the test code? Uh, and then, um, and so I, I typically try not to recommend something, but it used to be I would just say use Ruby because <laughs> that was what I was good at. And now I realize it's a lot easier for, for me to learn all the languages than it is to encourage people to use one language over the others. So it really depends on their, their, uh, their environment. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question that came up a couple times was people asking about um, if there's any other Selenium Java-based framework or libraries which are equal or better than Protractor for Angular JS. Uh, oh, so this is like a specific question, I guess, about testing Angular apps uh, using something in Java. Um, well, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's that's tricky, right? You know, Protractor does a good job specifically for Angular. Uh, and I've seen some talks where people basically recreate uh, Protractor in other languages, which is really cool. But the fundamental thing is that under the hood, it's still Selenium and it just has helper methods that map to the different locator patterns that exist within uh, an Angular app. And so it's really, uh, you know, it saves you some time, but it also really is specific to Angular. So I've seen a lot of organizations where they say, we're going to use Angular. And then they say, oh, you know what? We're going we're gonna to switch to another JavaScript framework. And, and then eventually they have three JavaScript frameworks and there's really not a good uh, there's not a good footing at that point if you're really all in on Protractor. So uh, I have I haven't seen a good Java a library for an equivalent thing like uh, like Protractor, but I don't think it's necessarily something that you need. Is basically what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Um, there were a lot of questions around mobile testing and just kind of curiosity on that. And I guess the specific theme was around whether or not you need to go with Appium. Um, if you're going to do mobile testing or if you can make Selenium work to do the same thing and kind of what you recommend for, for mobile testing and, and the framework to use. Yeah, yeah, for mobile testing, it's like Selenium isn't like what WebDriver as you're used to for desktop browsing isn't built for that. Like there's, there's Selendroid, there's iOS driver, there's Appium. They're all built on WebDriver and you really, if you're looking at native, the native app testing, um, any, any sort of app testing, you really need to use something like one of those different fr um, frameworks. But they're all they're all basically in, in the same ecosystem, um, but but they are relevant. Okay, okay. Um, I think we're we're a little bit over time, so I'm uh, tempted to to ask one more question, and then um, Dave and I actually talked before the webinar um, about we got so many questions um, as you guys registered, and we're getting a lot of questions right now, and maybe taking the common themes of those questions and converting it into some sort of blog post that will get sent out to you guys. Um, so Dave, I think we can collaborate on that after, because we did get a lot of uh, questions coming in. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, I think the last one was, um, more of a general question, can you describe what the Selenium IDE awaits in the future? Is it more likely that it's going to become out of date or will it, will it stay an important part of the Selenium world? So, so I think that it is interesting. So there's Selenium IDE, the Selenium Builder, which is meant to be kind of the predecessor uh, or rather the, the thing that will, will live on after uh, Selenium IDE. And the thing that a lot of people don't know about um, is that the reason that I think Selenium IDE exists, and it's uh, is ultimately because it came out of uh, a, a really strong need from Japan, um, and specifically, it was built uh, as a means for uh, for language integration. So easy, easily record tests and then have it work across different um, different spoken languages and written languages, and uh, that's something that I think is lost uh, with with newer versions of uh, the record and playback versions like Selenium Builder, and I think that. 
that in order for it to live on and still be widely used, I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, but I do think that there will always be the need and want for a record and playback tool. Um, I think that ultimately uh, everyone tries to solve that same problem and create commercial versions of it. So, but I haven't seen one company or one open source uh, equivalent really be the the full solution. I think it's still going to be something as a gateway for people to get started. There's still going to be interest. It's still going to exist. But uh, whether or not it's it's like a, a practical use of um, in someone's tool belt, um, most like most people will just I ideally reach for a programming language. Um, but the record and playback tool, I think, will still live on just because of uh, because of needs like what's what I mentioned in Japan. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. With that, I think we need to go ahead and wrap up. Dave, thank you so much. Um, there was some great feedback coming through um, the chat that I will be sharing with you. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Great. Thanks everybody.